following interview was conducted with Carl G. Brandt, Professor Emeritus of Biochemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, January 26, 2009, in his office on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Professor Marquis. Thank you. And uh, let's start with telling us where when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Uh, I was born in Galveston, Texas, uh, between 1900's hurricane, which was famous, and Isaac's storm, the, the book that was published, and Ike, which just happened this past year. Had a lot of experience with hurricanes, but nothing quite that dramatic. But I grew up in Galveston. We lived a block and a half from the Gulf, behind the seawall. Fort Crockett intervened between our house. We lived on T and a half street. There aren't many cities that have half streets, but Galveston, in its wisdom, started numbering the east-west streets with, not started labeling with letters, and they got about to M and realized they would run out of letters before they ran out of streets, so then they alternated the halves. At any rate, I, I went to elementary school there, Davy Crockett Elementary School. How large uh, a school was it? Oh, gee. Small? I don't remember. It, no, it was, was, it it was pretty grade? good size. Uh, no, it was six grades. Okay. Uh, and then when I was in about the sixth grade, uh, we moved to the mainland the first house my parents ever actually owned, the only house my parents actually owned. Uh, I had been on a, a half year schedule because of my birthday and so when we moved to the mainland my parents either had to set me forward or set me back so I went back half a year and started sixth grade over again but then uh, went to junior high and high school in Lamarck, Texas, a, a little bedroom community of Texas City, Texas where my father worked for American Oil Company. Uh, my father had a Ph.D. in chemistry. Uh, my mother was a high school graduate, but she typed his Ph.D. thesis, which he sent her by mail, snail mail, from Cornell, and she was in Topeka, Kansas, where she grew up, or, or in the environs there. And I don't know how she did it. I, I, I just can't imagine that now. But she was, uh, she was quite capable, although she never went to college. I have one sister. Uh, my sister uh, is younger than I am by about a year and a half. She now resides in Athens, Georgia. Uh, what were any activities in high school? And how, was you know, school? yes, yes, there were. Uh, oh. I, I was, uh, I, I, was on the football team because in Texas, if you were male and you weren't on the football team, uh, you, you just weren't going to make it. I mean, that was the sport in Texas, and so a lot of Friday night lights. Okay, but I was never a star. I didn't even make the varsity till my senior year. But I stuck but I it played. out. I played. I was there. I played, and I got a letter jacket my senior year. I don't know whether I really deserved it, but the guy that played in front of me went on to start for the University of Texas, so he was pretty good. And I could have been a whole lot better, and I'd still been second string. But but I did play football, mostly JV. But uh, my senior year, I was on the varsity. I was active in debate all the way through high school. I was on the debate team. My partner and I won the district contest several times. Went to a lot of speech contests. I did a little bit of poetry interpretation, uh, oral interpretation. I was president of my senior class, but that's about the extent. Oh, yeah. but I was at very active in Boy Scouts while I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So uh, I made it to Eagle Scout rank uh, while I was there in Lamarck and went to both the National Jamboree at Irvine Ranch in California in 1953 and then to the International Jamboree. Well. Canada <laughs> in, in 1955, but it was quite an experience. It was outside to, to, the United it, States. It was outside, that's, right. that's right. I had been to Mexico. My parents one summer had driven us all the way from Galveston, Texas to Mexico City, and that was quite a drive uh, in those days, but that was the only way you were going to get there. So we had driven to Mexico. I'd been there. My parents liked to travel, uh, always by car, and uh, we had been throughout the West. Uh, for most of us, we, we, Our typical vacation would be to go to Rocky Mountain National Park for as long as my father had vacation, set up camp, and then hike the mountains. Oh, so wow. we did that. We did Grand Canyon and Bryce and Zion and Carlsbad Caverns and Painted Desert, all those things. So uh, we, we did some traveling, but uh, that that was sort of the focus of my, of my high was school. Was your high school very large? No, it wasn't by today's standards. My graduating class, which was the largest one that had graduated at that time, was about 75 students. So That's by, there are a lot of small ones left in Indiana, but uh, compared with 
Jeff High School or Harrison High School or McCutcheon High School, uh, even Bus Lafayette High School. It was pretty small. Sure. We were a well, we were a pretty close knit group, and we had a lot of fun. So. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of, and you keep a lot of that companionship and things of that sort. You know, actually, I don't. Oh, I'm. I, when you're in, when you're in a small class. Oh, though, oh, there, in yes, school, and, oh, yeah. and I, you know, I knew virtually everybody in my sure. class, but I have not stayed in touch with them. I don't know why. A lot of people but, do. But I, it, I sort it of lost track too. Yeah, my my wife is very much in touch with some of her classmates, but uh, but that that never was was something that I that I did. Uh, or continued with and whatever. Or, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. I mean, I still get emails from because there's a, a an exchange every time somebody dies. I hear about it. Yeah. I don't know whether you put that sort of stuff in to transcribe. Okay. <laughs> then how did where did you go to college? What was next? Um, it's interesting. I I had always wanted to go to Rice University. It was Rice Institute, the Rice Institute at that time. Uh, I was actually in the last class to graduate from the Rice Institute. And the next year, they changed it to Rice University. Why did they do that for the researchers? Be because initially, was it a the, the college? Oh, no, it was a four-year science and engineering school, okay. uh, plus graduate school. But uh, it was very much focused in its inception on science and engineering. So, like MIT, uh, Caltech, uh, Georgia Tech, uh, it was an institute. It wasn't didn't have the word university, but while I was there, and starting before I was there, they had made a concerted effort to broaden the scope of the educational offerings, to emphasize the liberal arts more, to uh, start a uh, college of architecture. They now have a very fine uh, college of music. And so at that point they decided we are not just a science and engineering institute anymore, we are a university. So they changed the name to university, and uh, I tell people I'm a graduate of Rice University because they never heard of Rice Institute. Uh, but uh, it's like uh, teachers' colleges, or uh, that's right, exactly the normal schools that the they normal. used to have. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. Right. So the the other thing that I'm really proud of about my my undergraduate work is that I have a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry. Uh, everybody in chemistry, physics, mathematics got BAs because the curriculum that we were obliged to fulfill, and in those days, you did what you were told, of course. You know, it wasn't, oh, I think uh, I want to take these courses now, and so forth. But uh, it was, it, it was one that, that, that had built, but it had built in a substantial component of liberal arts courses. So I took uh, two years of German, one year of French, I took uh, several years of history, I had several years of English, uh, political science. Uh, so I, I really had pretty a, broad a, a pretty broad education, and that influenced me immensely as I went on through the rest of my education and came to Purdue in some of the things that I tried to do. Mm -hmm. So, I graduated from Rice in 1960, uh, cum laude. Uh, went off to graduate school. I I know in your notes you want to know what activities did I do in college, Zippo. It was not something that. Were that there I, many clubs? Were there actually? Oh, the maybe women some? had what they called oh. literary societies okay. for the like women the, students. Like the honoraries are sort of. Yes, right. but for guys, I don't remember much if you didn't play intramural sports or weren't into acting in the theater. What about fraternity? Were you in a fraternity? There were no fraternities. No fraternities, no, no sorority. sororities. No, that was. Do they have them today? Not to my knowledge. When I was there, they started the college system based upon what they had in, uh, oh, I don't know where the origin was, but each residence hall became a quote-unquote right. residential college. It's a little bit college. like Oxford and Cambridge, and then yes. and Harvard has somewhat of yes. that, and so does Yale. So there was a, a faculty member in his family that mm -hmm. lived in a home that was associated with it, that ate dinner with us uh, most nights, and we all had to wear coats and ties to dinner on Sunday, and uh, so they tried to create a different kind of living environment than just a standard old dormitory. Right. So within that complex, so there was a lot of things that social activities and whatever went on in there. That's right. Oh, I played a lot of bridge. Oh. Uh, yeah, we after dinner every night, group of oh. several groups of us would sit around the table in the lounge and get out the cars and we'd play bridge. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> so after you graduated, then you decided to go into grad school, or? Well, yes. Uh, it, it's it's interesting. I I became a chemistry major because my father was a chemist, and I thought that's interesting. Okay, I'm not sure. 
that I had any real idea beyond the fact that my father was a chemist and I could do chemistry. I had some severe second thoughts when I took physical chemistry as a junior that I didn't know this was going to work out or not, but I hung with it and made it through. I, <laughs> a humorous story. Now, uh, my senior year, uh, analytical organic chemistry taught by E.S. Lewis, the son of G.N. Lewis, famous physical chemist, uh, wrote a textbook I got up on my shelf there. He taught the course and he was a very shy individual. All the unknowns, we had to figure out what unknowns we were given, had these tests, and I swear all of my unknowns, none of them behaved normally. And I was having a very frustrating time. I could handle the exams in the class, but the, the laboratory was just driving me up the wall. About a week before the end of the semester, I was working in a lab, and Professor Lewis walked in, and he stopped behind me and looked over my shoulder and said, so how are things going? And at that point, something had just gone wrong again, and I blew up. And I let him know how badly <laughs> things were going, <laughs> and, and stormed out of the lab and got back to my room and immediately had very serious second thoughts about what I had done here to a professor in my major a week before graduation. So the next morning I was camped outside his door, his office door, when he arrived and I was, I apologized immensely. He, he was very gracious and everything. Uh, it didn't stop me from graduating cum laude, but I, I had all these fears, you know, I will not graduate, all those kinds couldn't of things. Couldn't sleep all night, couldn't wait to get there. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Gotcha. But, but when I was in my senior year, my advisor said, well, of course you're going to go into graduate school. And I said, well, I guess so. I, I had a summer job lined up with Continental Oil Company, but uh, I applied to graduate schools and uh, was accepted at every place I applied and ultimately went to MIT, which was a, a good decision. It was quite a distance from Texas, though. Hey, oh, it is. I, I had never been to Massachusetts. When we went to the International Jamboree in Canada, we took the train. Mm -hmm. We congregated in Dallas, uh, took the train to Washington, D.C., and did some touring there, because most of us kids had never sure. been there. Uh, we took the train to New York and went to Radio City Music Hall on the top of the Empire State Building and the, and the top of the Statue of Liberty because then you could get up there. And then we took the train to uh, Toronto, Canada, for the, because the, That's where it, was. It, was, it was outside of Toronto. On the way back, we went through Detroit and saw a baseball game, a pro base. There were no pro baseball, major league teams in Texas at that time. Uh, so we saw a major league baseball game and then back to little old Texas. Town in Texas, yeah. So uh, uh, I had never been to Massachusetts, though. But my advisor said, you go to the best school you get into. Don't worry about whether you're going to like it or not. You're only going to be there four years or so, and you might like it. And so I went to MIT. It was, I don't know, the other schools I got into were good schools, too. Uh, but uh, this was clearly the one that had the the name so I went and it was it was tough uh, but I loved Boston I met my wife in there she was working as a nurse and uh, was she from around there she's from Western Massachusetts out in uh, the Berkshires uh, Pittsfield Massachusetts mm -hmm. and when we ultimately came out here uh, two years after I finished my PhD I postdoc for two years uh, working for the same person George Hess who is uh, at Cornell he, He's still active on the faculty, uh, but uh, his first year, the first year I was with him, he was at the University of Pennsylvania on a sabbaticals, and he wondered if I would come down there, so I did. It was fine with me, but retrospectively, I wish I'd spent both years in Ithaca. It's a much nicer environment. Uh, big cities, I can do, I like to visit them, okay? They've got lots of amenities, theater, concerts, etc., but restaurants, <laughs> but... Uh, MIT was good for me. Uh, it's where I discovered biochemistry. I've told the story to countless classes of mine. When I went to MIT, I was an organic chemistry major. That's what I wanted to focus on. And I worked with Professor John Sheehan from a PhD dissertation. He is the person, uh, he's now passed away, but he is the person who first synthesized penicillin 
from scratch. That's an organic chemist's way of documenting that we know what the structure is when by an, an unambiguous series of steps you can go from known compounds to this other compound. And he had done that. It was a very difficult rite of passage. But I worked for him on a related antibiotic, Kephalosporins, which had just been discovered at the time I was there. But we had to minor in something. I said, you've got to minor in something. Well, as I tell students, I was so glad that I passed the physical chemistry qualifier when we had to take it there, or orientation exam, and I thought, good, I don't have to take any more physical chemistry. I always thought inorganic chemistry was dull. I wasn't smart enough to realize how important analytical chemistry would be in the rest of my career. The only alternative left was biochemistry, so I minored in biochemistry, and I fell in love with it. And I decided then, okay, I'm going to postdoc in biochemistry. That allowed me to shift from being an organic chemist to a biochemist with a strong organic chemistry background, which I've drawn on substantially. Fabulous. And I postdoc those two years, and then I came to Purdue and uh, joined. How did, did, uh, how did you get an offer to come to Purdue? Were you, did you go to Cornell then after? Uh, uh, yes, the first course? year we were at the University of Pennsylvania, the second oh. year we were at Cornell in Ithaca, which interestingly enough, that's where my father got his PhD. Mm -hmm. That was not the reason that I went, that I sought to postdoc with George Hess. The linkage there had been that he had done a postdoc with John Sheehan, with whom I did my PhD. He was doing some, what I thought, interesting work on enzyme kinetics of uh, enzymes that hydrolyze proteins. Uh, I thought, okay, there's some organic chemistry there. Sure. But when I went to work with him, he was interested in reaction mechanisms and kinetics, particularly fast reaction uh, kinetics. So that's why he had done the sabbatical at Philadelphia and the Johnson Research Foundation at the University of Pennsylvania. So I learned how to do what are called temperature jump kinetic studies, where you hit a solution with a burst of uh, electrical energy and the temperature jumps up in about a microsecond and you watch the reactions relax. So you can study reactions on the microsecond time scale. And I also did some what are called stopped flow kinetic studies, where you mix two reactants in a few milliseconds and then you can watch the progress of the reaction from millisecond time scale. So I learned all of that with, with George. <laughs> I remember the first day I walked into his lab there in Philadelphia. He said, well, we're going to be doing some kinetic experiments, uh, Carl. He said, uh, here's some differential equations. Why don't you solve these tonight and come back tomorrow and we'll talk about them. I hadn't thought about calculus for, well, since I finished with it as an undergraduate six years earlier but I still had my calculus textbooks. So uh, I went home that night and I pulled them out and I sweated bullets, but I got it done. So my first day was not a disaster, <laughs> but I learned, oh, if you learn things well enough, you can leave them alone for a while, but you can bring them back. So that was an important, an important part of, of my education and uh, my, my training as a, a biochemist. Mm -hmm. But uh, at any rate, uh, George Hess had a lot of contacts around the country, and he knew that Purdue, that Barney Axelrod's department was looking for someone. Uh, he knew someone. Was it a, a, a younger, a smaller department at that time? Or? Uh, it was, and it was totally changing its makeup. It had been very much an agricultural chemistry department, and if you look at the south entrance, over the it's door, a, it says a, agricultural a, chemistry. Yeah, some of the research I've done, uh, that is the predecessor. That's right. Yeah, sure. And Barney had uh, obtained permission from the dean to make it into a, bio, a modern biochemistry department, which was Barney's uh, origin. So a number of faculty members that had been here left or went to other departments, and Barney brought in a lot of young people. I, when I came in, there were five of us that came in that same fall. Uh, Hank Weiner, Howard Zalkin, uh, Gunter Kohlhoff, Larry Butler, and myself. And Vic Rodwell had just been here for six months at that point. He was a more senior person. He came in as an associate professor. We all came in totally green out of postdocs. Uh, Did you come in as assistant professors? We all came in as assistant professors, and we all sat down and got to work writing grant proposals to try to get money to support our research program. And we got busy teaching because at that time you didn't get, well, we'll let you young faculty members have a semester off with no teaching responsibilities <laughs> while you get your lab up and going. We had to do both of them at the same time. I understand. 
and you know it's like walking to school uphill both ways in the snow you know <laughs> but in so many ways the many of the things that I hear from people you have to put it in that perspective like what the cost of living was and what produced right. charges and so that it doesn't jump out at you when the tuition there weren't for years there wasn't any tuition it was only fees that's right so there was no tuition and that was one of the nice things about rice there was no tuition at all as as a as a valedictorian of my high school which I was my backup had I needed it, was to go to the University of Texas because I had a full scholarship as a valedictorian to the University of Texas. Well, you know, it was worth $25. That's what tuition was at the University of Texas because of all the oil money. They didn't have to charge a whole lot of tuition. Just a small fee. Just a small fee. Right. <laughs> so, uh, House pays for the food. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, you still had food expenses and living expenses. Yeah, but I know. Uh, at any rate, so I came here. Uh, fall of 66 as an assistant professor and started teaching that first semester. Whereabouts did you live? What was housing like when you came? Uh, we lived in the Whispering Winds Apartments at which the top are, of Happy Hollow Road. Which are still here. I know they're still here. And you go across that bridge over the, <laughs> the, the bypass and what was then Riverview Apartments was there. I mean, these were sort of new apartments at that time. But uh, Williamsburg was here then, and it's still here. But we lived in Whispering Winds Apartments up there on the top of Happy Hollow Road for the first three years while we saved up some money. And, Did you uh, have any children at that time? No, we oh. didn't. Uh, I'd been married for a year and a half. Uh, we got married in January of 1965. I came in the fall of 1966, and uh, somewhere around, uh, well, it, no, not somewhere around. I know exactly when, December. 19th, 1967, our daughter was born, and our son was born in April of 1970. So uh, my wife was a nurse, and she worked as a nurse here for a while. At the hospitals? Uh, and she worked uh, at the Purdue Hospital for a while, and but then she stopped until our kids uh, got into school. Uh, so uh, I was working here. I remember that first year, Purdue went to the Rose Bowl with Bob Greasy. And Did you go? I told her, we can't go. We can't afford to go out there. And I've got to get these grant proposals written. I said, I promise you the next time Purdue goes to the Rose Bowl, we'll go. So 30 whatever years later it was, <laughs> we went to the Rose Bowl. And our, our son went with us. And our son-in-law went with us. But our daughter stayed home in Cincinnati because she was expecting their first child and so she stayed home while her husband was out there the robo on, on the cell phone with her. <laughs> That's all right. You watch it on TV. So but, did I. Uh, but but we, we, we did go that next time uh, with that the first was with Bob Greasy of course and then the next time was with Drew Brees. So uh, so that so that was fun. But I started out here and uh, yeah, then tell us a little bit about that and then moving into yeah. the agriculture. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Moved up to the ranks. I, I taught a variety of courses. Uh, I, I taught analytical biochemistry. I taught the introductory biochemistry course, especially as a course on kinetics. Taught a course on chemistry of enzyme action. And I had my own research group. Uh, overall, I, I had uh, 10 students that got graduate degrees with me, nine got PhDs and one got a master's degree. Um, but the truth is that the teaching was A, my love, and B, my strength. Uh, I did research. I got NIH support to support my, my research program. But I had realized I was never going to be, I was never going to set the world on fire as a researcher, where my talents lay. Uh, education. You like working with the students. Working with the students. Right. And if there is, well, one of the great things about being a university is the students. Sometimes they get under your skin, but it, it really is it really is great. So at that point in about 19, uh, the early 1980s, when I'd been here for 14, 15 years. I, I had you already been promoted full professor. I had made, been promoted twice. I was full professor, that's right. And things were, were, were going along okay, but I could not see myself continuing to do that, to, do, to grub for dollars forever. And an opportunity opened up to be assistant dean of the graduate school. Struther Arnott, who was dean of the graduate school at that time, invited me to come down and take a, a 
third time position, half time, I don't remember what it was. As dean of the school. As an assistant dean of the, of the graduate school and sort of taste administration. I had been a candidate for department head in this department and lost the position. And I, I, no, that's the wrong thing to say. The committee made the right decision. They picked the best person to be another department head of our department. Another candidate was selected. That's right, another it. candidate was selected. Uh -huh. uh, and that was the right decision. But in the process of interviewing for that, I learned some things about myself and what I might want to do and what some of my strengths might be. And I guess Struther Arnott got wind of it, and he knew me from interactions, biology, biochemistry, and everything. Because he'd been over in the... Oh, of course. That's right. He'd been department head in biological sciences. That's right. Before he went to the grad school. That's right. So he invited me to come down, and it was an opportunity I just couldn't pass up. So I went down and did that. I learned... Where was, excuse me, where was it located? Because the grad house was not built at that time. Oh, yes, it was. Oh, was it? It, it, oh, okay. it, was, it was in the, uh, the one that's farthest... Oh, uh, east, whichever yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, it was it was where it is now. Oh, okay. I forgot so, what year that was built. So I, I was there for three years, had one very interesting experience in that uh, while I was over there, someone from a university on the East Coast sent a letter to the graduate school saying that he had discovered that there was a thesis from a student at Purdue that had plagiarized his work. So brother asked me to do the research, the background on it, and I did, and uh, it was pretty clear cut. So the home department of this student did not think that anything needed to be done, but Dean Arnott thought otherwise. So I was delegated to prosecute the case before the Graduate Council, or to present the case, the student chose not to come. Uh, he had a, an attorney, but the attorney really had no standing in front of the graduate council. And, uh, he was just serving as a representative. That's right. Uh -huh. And uh, the graduate council listened to all the evidence and voted, I don't remember what the vote was, but voted to rescind the PhD degree, and, or voted to recommend. The graduate council couldn't rescind it. The board of trustees was all that could rescind it, but voted to recommend to the Board of Trustees that the PhD be rescinded. So Dean Arnott took that recommendation to the Board of Trustees and it was rescinded. I don't know if we ever got back the diploma or not because the person was an international student and he was long since gone, uh, several years gone. But uh, that, that was quite an experience for me to, yeah. to deal, with, deal with that. It was not exactly a, oh, well, it's just another day at the office, you know. <laughs> or a week either. <laughs> it's, but it was a real introduction to administration because sometimes you have to deal with, with yeah. sticky issues like that. That's right. I had just, I mean, I stayed involved in the department. I continued to teach in the department because I was two-thirds time here. Stayed involved in the department. Uh, I continued to teach. I worked with a colleague who was going on sabbatical and was interim major professor for several of his students. I had just sort of re-upped for an additional year in the graduate school when I learned that the College of Agriculture, or the School of Agriculture then, was going to open up a search for an associate dean for what was then called resident instruction. It, we now call it academic programs. I brought about that change to make it a little bit more understandable. Yeah. But the responsibilities of that office were student recruitment, curriculum, academic advising, scholarships, uh, certifying graduates, placement, everything that related to the undergraduate primarily. Doing some counseling and advising. And I did not do much of that, but I oversight, oversight of, sure. of those. And I thought, undergraduate, graduate. My love was with undergraduates, okay? So I applied for the position. Now, you have to understand, if you remember everything I've said, you haven't heard anything mentioned about a farm, about a, in a farm in my background. Nothing about agriculture other than the biochemistry department is in the School of Agriculture. But I thought, well, let's see what happens. The dean at that time was Bernie Liska, who was a food scientist. He understood the importance of science. I had long been lobbying on the curriculum committee for there being more science in the curriculum of our college school. 
I'm going to keep calling it college, although they haven't been, it hasn't been a college till very recently. So I applied. I interviewed. I got lots, asked lots of questions about what did I know about agriculture. Of course, the answer was not much, but I was selected. I don't know how the committee voted, but I got an invitation from Bernie Liska to become associate dean, and I accepted it. That was one of the, the biggest events in my career. Uh, I, I had a lot of ideas, but the first thing I had to deal with was the enrollment in the College of Agriculture was, had been dropping for years. That was farm crisis, future of agriculture looked horrible, who wanted to major in agriculture? So we were down to 1,655. I remember that number like it's you know, etched it's an into easy my forehead. It runs together like 1787. That's right, yeah. But uh, And the message was the College of Agriculture is going to start losing resources if it doesn't get its enrollment back up. So I knew I was stepping into a, a very difficult situation, but I thought it was something we could make some progress on. So I got to work and we started a lot of initiatives, uh, not the least of which was a lot of personal hand-signed letters to parents and students who were admitted trying to convince them to come. And some programs that I'll talk about a little bit later here. But uh, about 15 months into my service as associate dean, Bernie Leska stepped down from being dean and Steve Beering asked me to become interim dean of the college. Now, here I am. Small town boy from Texas that has never lived on a, oh, my grandparents had a hobby farm, you know, and we, they had a, a milk cow and raised sweet corn, but what did I know about agriculture? Nothing. But I think what Dr. Beering wanted is he wanted the college to become more focused on science, and I was a biochemist. He was really enamored with biotechnology and the potential of its application within the food system. And so he asked me to serve. And what do you do? Do you tell the president of the university, uh, sorry, I uh, no. This said, uh, but, but I also didn't get any help in the associate dean's position, so I, had, had, I was doing sure, both right. things at yeah. once, and that's the one year that I didn't teach a course over here in the biochemistry department. No hours. You know, no all hours all the it. time I was associate dean, other than that year, I taught the freshman biochemistry course here, which I dearly loved. But uh, I, I tell you, I travel around the state. I, I can name all 90 county, 92 counties if you want, but you don't want that. Uh, I learned Indiana geography. When I became associate dean, even when I became a dean still, Early in the spring, I couldn't tell you what it was coming up until it got tall enough I knew it, it couldn't be soybeans anymore, it had to be corn. But now I can tell them apart. I still can't tell the small grains apart. and I don't know breeds of livestock. I used to kid some of my friends in animal science at IGECON that, uh, well, you know, what's so important about livestock? It's the dead stock that's important to most people. It's the way it looks on the, on the counter in the, in, the, in, the, in the grocery store, you know, whether, whether it looks good. Right. <laughs> so I... I I had fun with it, but I, I learned a lot. Uh, there's no question about it. But we put in place, a, subsequently, the, the new dean was named, but oh, I need to tell you this story too. Under Bernie Liska, we had begun to deal administratively with the fact that federal funding for colleges of agriculture was either flat or going down. Now, in the college, we have a lot of faculty and staff that are supported off federal funds. And when Purdue would get state funds and decree a 3% salary increase, we felt we had to provide that increase for faculty regardless of whether they were funded on federal funds, which got no increase money, or state funds. So we kept cannibalizing internal funding to make up this difference. Uh, well, it had reached the point where we couldn't do that anymore. And so Bernie Gliska had decided that we were going to have to downsize. He stepped down from department head. I was named so, uh, acting dean. 
it was clear from the university that we were not going to get any additional resources to help us out. We were going to have to downsize. So I had the privilege, <laughs> privilege, of initiating that downsizing. There are former department heads here who can still tell you how many positions they lost in this downsizing. It, it was it was not nice. I mean, we, it, it, it was not that there were arguments or in, anything untoward, but it was not a pleasant process to go through because everybody was having something carved out of them. But we did get it started and we set up the parameters working with the other associate deans and department heads so that when the new dean came in, Bob Thompson, he didn't have to bear the brunt of being the one that caused this downsizing. I, I got things started, well Bernie Liska got it started, I initiated the process of eliminating positions and Bob Thompson could come in and say, okay, now we're going to follow through with this, but we're also going to see how we can improve ourselves and be better. So I, I felt like I, I did a great service. It was service. a continuum. You handled it straightforward. That, right. That's right. right. And, uh, but during that time, we were also trying to uh, uh, increase our enrollment. So we developed a variety of programs. We developed a scholarship program, that a merit-based scholarship program that started out with just freshmen. At that time, it was $1,000, which was a lot in, 60, in 80, 85 or so. Right. Uh, in subsequent years, not immediately, but we added sophomore and junior and senior merit-based scholarships so that we could promise a student coming in who had done well in high school that if you continue to do well, you've got $2,500 in scholarship money from the college that you don't have to apply for. All you have to do is maintain your grades. We had developed programs that uh, provided outreach to high schools, uh, professors in the classroom program that I started. Right. Uh, uh, we did a symposium on campus for high school science teachers, and, and all of this was part of my goal of enhancing the understanding statewide of parents and students that the College of Agriculture is about science also. Right. It's not just the biological science department that does science. It's not just chemistry that does science. There's some neat science Within in, the, in the College of Agriculture, in the School of Agriculture. So my idea was let's send Purdue agriculture faculty out to high school science classes where they will talk to a chemistry class or a biology class about how what the students are learning in high school chemistry or biology finds application in some fascinating problems within the food system. I went out, I, had, I developed three talks myself, and I, I don't know how many trips I made out. You can count them in my, in my Vita, because I did keep track of it, but it was oh, fun. Yes. It was also educational for our faculty, because you go out and you give five lectures in the same day, you know, with 10 minutes in between, whereas, you know, here, we, you know, we go to class for 15 minutes, and then maybe nothing else that day in classroom. So it was very educational about what the challenges are for high school teachers that they deal with every day. And I would have faculty come back and they call me up, Carl, we've got a problem. I said, what's that? He says, do you know what's happening in the high school science class? I said, yes, I do. <laughs> now you do too. <laughs> and it, so it, it served a, a two-way benefit, but it got the teachers to recognize that, oh, there are some people here at Purdue in the College of Agriculture that we could call on to help us understand some things. And we went to the high school agriculture classes too. But the high school agriculture classes were always problematic because they were vocational classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a whole other issue. If you want to talk about that, we can talk about that. But uh, So we did those kinds of programs. Uh, we developed uh, a, a, a little newsletter called Research the Future in Agriculture that highlighted fascinating research, we thought, in agriculture. And we sent it gratis to all the high school science teachers in Indiana and agriculture teachers. Uh, a lot of personal contact. Uh, we built a computerized database long before the Department, of, uh, the Department of Admissions had one where people that we'd been in contact with or that our alumni or the extension faculty and extension agents out in the county had sent us names that you ought to stay in touch with this student. So we kept, you know, when they're going to graduate from high school and we'd send them something every year. Uh, we did just a whole variety of things and get the message out and get right. the message out that's right and connect over time agriculture got out of the doldrums 
And we got our, we, we set a goal our, for ourselves with 2,500 undergraduates, and we got up there. Um, I think the highest I, we got while I was associate dean was something like 2470, something like that. It was within, as I would say as a scientist, the experimental error of 2,500 uh, of our goal. But I'll tell you, those first years, when I walked across campus and saw a, a vice president coming, I, I just gritted my teeth because I knew the first words out of his mouth, and they were all his mouths then, okay? We didn't have any women at, at that level. Uh, first words out of his mouth, how's enrollment looking, Carl? And I think, God, uh, because that was just, that was gonna be it. But we solved that problem. And while I was doing all this, I also took on, working with our curriculum committee, a significant overhaul of both our admissions requirements and our curriculum requirements, our core curriculum requirements. For biochem? No, oh, for, for the school. For the school, okay. Uh, I was never concerned about biochemistry's requirements, but the, I really felt that the core curriculum of the school and the experience that most of our students had were too parochial, too limited, too inward looking. And so I pushed and pushed and argued and debated and had discussions with the curriculum committee and departments to increase our math requirements so that freshmen coming into the College of Agriculture met similar math requirements to the School of Science. Uh, in other words, college algebra didn't count towards graduation. Calculus was required of all students. Uh, that was not an easy one to sell um, because, well, you know, I didn't have calculus. The faculty would say, I didn't have calculus when I was in college. I said, so does no one need to know any more than you learned when you were in college? Well, no. Well, then. So we, we got the message across. We increased the amount of science that students had to have, that every student had to have. Now, lots of them had more science than, than the minimum, but we increased it in all the programs. And then my real goal was to add credits in the humanities and social sciences so that we broadened the education. And we almost doubled requirements for coursework in the humanities and social science for all of our graduates. So we made the degree, the, the, the curriculum, a little closer to a liberal arts degree. It's not. It never was, even, but, but, but it's closer. The students didn't know why they were taking these, but I would tell them, you know, I didn't know why I took them when I was in school either. You know what my job is now? I don't spend much time in the lab. I spend most of my time working with people. And when you're working with people, the chemistry that you know doesn't do you any good unless you're talking to a chemist. When you're dealing with the public, you've got to have things you can talk about. You've got to understand the political environment. You've got to understand soci society. So taking these courses can help prepare you, not for your first job, but for your second or third when you advance a little bit. We got the message across, and then we added an international understanding requirement, and we built our study abroad program. We, at one time, the School of Agriculture led the university in percent of our graduates who had studied abroad. I didn't have a, everything to do with that, but I worked very closely with our international programs office, and we were very proud of that. Uh, liberal arts always had more numbers, but in terms of percentage, we, we were at that time leading, leading the university. So, and then ultimately, we added uh, a requirement, an admissions requirement for foreign language. We had also increased the amount of math and science that students needed to have in high school to get in the College of Agriculture. Much to the dismay of the high school agriculture teachers who saw this as drawing students away from their classes. But my argument was, you come to Purdue, you're gonna take freshman chemistry. You're sitting in the same class with students that are in engineering and science. Do you wanna compete? Well, yes, we need them to compete so they can succeed. Right. Then you need more science and math in, in high school. And we also upped the requirement, uh, the quality requirement. When I first moved over there, the requirement for agriculture and technology, and I believe CFS was upper two-thirds quality. And we raised ours to upper half quality to be on a par with School of Science. Again, 
much to the dismay of many faculty members because they saw it as excluding a group of students. And I said, my argument was, look, we want our students to be prepared to compete. That means they've got to work hard in high school. Being upper half quality is not the end of the world. A student that really wants to come to Purdue can make it. And so we got that through. But I have to say, I don't think any of these changes would have become reality had it not been for the three deans I worked with. For uh, Bob Thompson, uh, <laughs> Bob Thompson, Vic Lechtenberg, and uh, uh, oh, for goodness sakes, I'm, th this is horrible. Uh, maybe, maybe those were the two. Because then uh, Woodson came after. Yeah, Lechtenberg. but but he was that I had moved back over here uh -huh. by then. At any rate, uh, but Bob Thompson and Vic Lechtenberg at any faculty meeting where one of these issues came up, they without my asking the two, said to everybody there, I think what's being proposed is the right direction to go. That carried weight. Uh, I didn't have the cachet that the dean had, but, uh, but we got, so we, we really upgraded the quality of our students. At the same time, we were increasing the number of our students, and, and we were giving our students an experience which was a much broader education. We were getting them abroad, and I really felt good about what I had had managed, I shouldn't say what I should say what we had meant because curriculum is a faculty domain. One person wanting something doesn't make it work. You've got to convince the faculty to take ownership in it and pass it, and we did accomplish that, and I, I felt really good about that. So talk a little bit about what about diversity? You, you, that was built in too. Uh, it was built in. I. I hired the first uh, African American staff member over there in academic programs. Uh, at the time, she was working on a master's degree in at Purdue, and she knew nothing about agriculture, but she sure knew about the African American experience. So uh, she built some programs of outreach to some of the high schools in Indiana that had some significant uh, African American population. After she graduated, she became an extension agent. And I hired someone, uh, another person who was doing uh, a master's degree in uh, in communication. Uh, the the really disappointing thing is that in that area, while we we solved the male female, although some of my female faculty colleagues used to always remind me, no, you didn't solve it. It's better, but it's not solved yet. And and I agree with them. Okay. Uh, Oh, you know, when I came here, there were some real good old boys on the faculty that uh, Bernie Liska had, had had great advice for me at one point. He said, this was when something I was really hoping we could get through the faculty on a curriculum change failed in the vote. And he said, Carl, let me tell you. He said, you just have to keep leaning in the right direction. And every now and then, a few people retire, and you'll gain ground. I recall that 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 piece of advice many times during my my uh, eighteen years over there as associate dean. But we never made real progress on increasing the percentage of minority students. We, I think, we're to the point where we're about fifty-fifty, male, female. But we never got beyond uh, a few percent. We never got up to our goal was to have a percent percentage of minority students equal to the percentage of the population in Indiana. We never got there. It it was a real difficult. Uh, it's a challenge. Cha yeah, that's it still right. Still is right. Yeah. So it still is, uh, but um, doesn't mean you quit trying. No. But uh, one thing I was going to ask you the. Um, IU School, of, were you ever doing any work with the IU School of Medicine here? No, I did um, not. Okay. Uh, the I department did, did okay. uh, but I, I never had any particular contact with that myself. Uh, Mark Hermitson, who was our department chair head at the time, did. Sure. Okay. He's the one that got the department head position that I didn't get, but, and that was the right decision, okay? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> okay. Um, fundraising has certainly changed. It has. Uh, I never had to do much of it myself. Did they have somebody in the school? They had someone in the school. I was very dependent on 
on that for our scholarship program. Sure. But our alumni, the College of Agriculture alumni, had a history of supporting the college. Of course, and you've so got your egg uh, extension egg, agents. That's the, right. The, the egg, uh, your egg alumni association. That's right. Which is that's right. Long oh, and and. And Maury was here. Ma when Maury, I still remember my first trip with Maury to Adams County shortly after I'd been named associate dean. Maury never took a four-lane road when there was a two-lane road available. And I don't think he ever drove over 45 or 50 miles an hour. And he, we would talk the whole way to these, these meetings. And we, we were driving up to Adams County, and I'm looking at my watch. We're going to be late to this place, and my first chance to, to speak to an alumni group and so forth. And we're driving along, and we're just about to Adams County, and all of a sudden there's a sign, Bridge Out. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how are we going to get there now? And says, Morris says, don't worry about it. So he did a U-turn, we went back, and he took the first county road to the south for half a mile, and turned east on a county road, and we went a couple of miles, and we turned north on a county road and went back a mile and we picked up the road we had turned off of and I said, how'd you know how to do that? He says, you don't understand the county road system? I said, no. He said, oh, just these numbers, they, they tell you how far you've gone and they all run north, south, east, west. So if you're going on one road and there's a, 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 a detour, so you can just make a U around it. And I thought, okay, I've learned something. And I used that with my kids coming back from someplace one time and they how'd you know to do that? And I said, let me tell you this. And, you know, suddenly you look very big in your kid's eyes because you understand this bit about, about geography. But uh, yeah, the, the, alumni, the alumni of the college were great. When I moved into <coughs> Ag Administration, there were no computers. And I went to the Ag Alumni Association and I said, we need computers so we can start building this contact file database because we need to be able to know students' names and addresses and where they are in school and what their interests are and so they gave me the funds to buy the first computers in academic programs, and this was in 84, 85, something like that. Sure. So, uh, oh yes, they, they were great supporters of us. That's a long, I think, I'm not sure whether that's older than the Purdue Alumni Association, or, but they must be fairly close. And, you know, I, I, they must be fairly close, but I, I don't so, know. But, yeah. uh, I, I, Daniel I Lester could tell you for sure. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> right. Uh, were you a fact fellow? Tell us just a couple comments. On I was a faculty fellow in Owen Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed that because I like students. <laughs> the problem was I was a faculty fellow while I was associate dean, and there were so many calls on me to be out in evenings that uh, that I had to give it up. I, I did for about three years. It's a great program. It is, but it's changed a lot now because... I'm a fact fellow at Tarkington, and see the eating facilities have all been oh, that's right. right. And it's difficult to get together with the students where it was easier. They'd be in the mm -hmm. hall, and then they'd meet us down there. So mm -hmm. um, this has, and others have shared similar things. Okay, well, I, I did not, I hadn't thought about that, although I've been over to some of the new eating areas, and it is clearly harder to have a group together because not every residence hall has its own dining facilities. No, and sometimes the RAs, as somebody said, the RA has difficulty, because now also the students can eat any place. They can, mm -hmm. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas before, obviously, it was easier to eat That's in right. their own yeah. residence hall. So it has, it has made some changes. But I, I, but enjoy I think that. it's a good program. It, it is, it is. And yeah. it, uh, I remember years ago, they used to have those winter dances, and we used to go to those, and a lot of those activities have changed over time. I bet they too. have. Yeah, but... Uh, we help out when they have the uh, boiler gold rush when they check in and we do mm -hmm. the uh, frozen stuff, something like that. Yeah. So it really is kind of nice, you know, we enjoy that. Uh, how about, uh, you got the Sagamore, but tell us about, you're also a founding fellow in the teaching academy. I am, academy. Uh, and, and you know, one of the questions that, that you asked uh, in, in your list of questions was, was something like uh, uh, an outstanding event in my life. Yes. And I couldn't, I couldn't come up with just one. Good. There are others that feel the same way, but, but I, I single it out it, because sometimes people sure. are comfortable with that. The, the first one has to be meeting my wife and our kids and their education and my wife getting her MSW degree after commuting for three years to IU, IUPUI back and forth and getting that degree and our kids' education. Did your children go here to Purdue? No, they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, they both got into Purdue, but neither one wanted to go to school in the backyard. So my daughter has her bachelor's degree from Brown, and then her MD from University of Virginia. Well, she's a doctor. She's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And our son has his bachelor's degree from DePaul, 
and his uh, uh, JD from IU uh, at Bloomington. I went to the Bloomington campus. Uh, and they're both doing fine. Uh, so uh, they're both married. Only one of them has kids so far, but uh, the other one's only been married a short time. So, uh, but, but so family has to be sure. important, uh, no question about it. Uh, second thing was it's the book of great teachers, but it was the Murphy Award. Uh, I was on sabbatical after I came over here back to the department. I'd never taken a sabbatical. I told the department head that I wanted to do, and I told the dean, I want to do a six month sabbatical. I was not going to start up a research program because I'd been out of research for 18 years and no granting agency in their right mind was going to drop a half million on me to retool as, uh, as a modern biochemist. So I wanted to do a sabbatical at Duke University studying bioethics. And they said, fine. So I did that. And while I was down there, I got a phone call from my wife one night and said, this letter arrived to you from the university, uh, from, I forget who it was from, it was somewhere in, in the administration of Vice Bob President. Bob Ringel, maybe? It, it probably was from Bob Ringel. And she said, do you want me to open it and read it to you? And I said, sure, go ahead. I had no idea what it was. And she opened it, and, and there was this long silence, and then she read what it was. And I mean, it just, just, it floored me, and, you know, I was floating, floating in the air because I had, I had, nominated so many people over the years for, for this and uh, now it's your time and, and now it was my time so so that w was was something that really caught me off guard and and really surprised me this the Sagamore too uh, but it, that one didn't I had seen people in administration retiring getting those so it didn't surprise me so much but the other one that surprised me that just again, was when I got a letter saying that I had been elected as an honorary member of Phi Beta Kappa. I was not elected to Phi Beta Kappa as an undergraduate, but I had some friends here that knew the kinds of things that I had been trying to accomplish in our curriculum and knew that I still graded all my own exams and that I had a reading assignment in my biochemistry course that the students had to write a book review of a book about a scientist or science. and. One of my friends nominated me, and I got this letter saying I had been elected to Phi Beta Kappa, and I thought, wow. Because, uh, again, I've been nominating students, undergraduates, to this for a long time without being a member of it and so forth. And so that, that was really uh, a high point for me. Uh, the, the other things that, that are memories that just really have been high points in, in my life since I've come to, to West Lafayette. Uh, one is from the theater, one is from uh, the symphony, and one is from uh, the Bach Chorale, uh, playing Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. My first really big role, and that cast, Wayne Lamb, who was a Purdue professor of theater at the time, uh, directed it, and that cast was, was a village. The chemistry in that cast, and we did it in Sunnyside Auditorium, Junior High School Auditorium. We packed the place three nights, uh, three, three performances. Uh, but it, it just was, was a real high point. And it, I, I came out of that, and I've told my kids this, with, with an understanding of family and kids growing up and wanting to do their own thing that I hadn't really come to realize with my own kids growing up. With that. They weren't, they weren't age old enough to be going off yet. But that, that play, that musical, is so much about family and granting release to your to your children, and the struggles uh, of the Jews in Eastern Europe, uh, and I'm not Jewish. I, I I I remember when we were auditioning in front of Wayne, and one of the things he wanted us to read was this passage between Golda and Tevye, where Tevye is trying to ignore her, and he he goes into prayer. I mean, he's he's praying. He can't be interrupted because he's praying. I didn't know any better. I dropped down on my knees. <laughs> it was only later that I learned Jews don't go down on their knees when they pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there, but I got the part. <laughs> so, so that was one. Uh, the Bach Chorale did a performance of Handel's Oratorio Solomon with the Bloomington Early Music Festival Orchestra and soloists from IU. And we did it up here at St. Mary Cathedral. We did Indianapolis at uh, 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 Crystal DeHaan 
auditorium at uh, University of Danvers, and then we did it at Bloomington in our hall in front of the music school faculty and students. We're, we're an quote-unquote amateur. There's some people that have music degrees, but most of them are like me that sing for the sheer love of it. And we did this performance in front of a packed house, and we got a standing ovation. Okay. And, I mean, all of us there just, just went, wow. <laughs> so, so that, and then uh, the third thing, uh, the Lafayette Symphony did a, a program here a few years ago, music for uh, December uh, to for a Christmas carol, and I did an oral interpreted uh, performance of a, a, of a an abridged version of a Christmas Carol, uh, for playing all the different parts uh, in different voices and with different physical attributes, and uh, uh, that would have the, been very enjoyable. To it, sit it, it was. It was. Once I got through with it, it was so enjoyable. I was sweating bullets because at that point my ability to memorize was was not what it had been at one time. Okay, but 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 those those were really high points. And then students, it has been such a joy for me over the years to have met so many really neat students, many of whom I still stay in contact with, not as frequently as I might like to. But you're in contact. But I'm in contact with them. And in contrast to my high school graduating class, where I don't have a whole lot of contact, I still get emails, uh, letters. I send them periodically uh, on that. But the, the sabbatical, the course that I developed on malaria, the freshman sophomore honors course, that I taught three times in my last five years after I came back over here, that was a real joy to teach. I had some, oh, just incredible students who have gone on to, mm -hmm. to I, one of them is on a Fulbright over in, in Zambia right now working on HIV, AIDS, TB research. And others have, have, have gone to medical school and they've gone to Africa or other developing nations. And so this course, which I was trying to open students up to some thinking about what sort of moral responsibility do we have? And let's look at some of these fascinating diseases that we don't have to worry about anymore unless we travel abroad, and yet are just incredibly interesting to think about how they're caused, how they're transmitted, why we can't cure them yet, what it's like to deliver health care in the third world. It, it was just, I, I had real good vibes, and I learned how to teach a discussion course. Biochemists don't teach discussion very much, okay, because we're teaching subject matter. But I did this discussion, and it was just, just marvelous. A nice change, right? So, so that, th those, those are things that I that I would consider uh, real highlights to me. Uh, and you kept, I should say, for the record, you kept very active, as you just mentioned, in the community. I did. I, I, I enjoy it. I yeah, my my hobbies are reading. Uh, I I read avidly, and I I just I zigzag. I, I right now. Well, I just went back and reread the book uh, Lincoln's Greatest Speech by Ronald White. It's about his second inaugural because we just had an inaugural that said, if you haven't thought about history in a while, let's think about history. And so I went back and reread that. And I got to find uh, Lincoln at Gettysburg, which is somewhere up here on my shelves. I want to reread that now. But then Harold Pinter died recently. And mm -hmm. so I pulled one of my copies of one of his plays. Well, I've got it right here in case I had some spare time. I'm rereading one of his plays. Uh, when Vonnegut died, I reread some of his work. I used to recommend these works to my class, uh, and I draw on some of them in, in my biochemistry class because uh, Cat's Cradle deals with a form of ice that uh, doesn't melt at room temperature, and so it, it's science. And so right. I, I do that. It enriches it. It does. Lies in the core. The and so I haven't done any acting in a while, other than with the symphony mainly because I don't memorize as well anymore, and the amount of time you put in to get ready for a play is immense. Yeah. But I, I dearly love theater. Um, I, I, I've i done enough of it that I've had the privilege of doing some really juicy parts. Uh, the last one I really did was Ben Franklin in 1776, and I used my own hair. I had a little bit more then, and I let it grow for a long time, but, uh, but you know, and I've told students over the years, there's a lot of teaching that draws upon the same things that being a good actor require. You're communicating. You're communicating orally. Now, yes, if the, you got lights in your eyes, you can't see the audience. But if you're not communicating, if, if, you're, if you're not seeming to make contact with them, you're not communicating. And in class, 
I've got to watch the class. I've got to see what the basic facial expressions are. I've, I've got to vary my voice. I've got to be dynamic, okay? Sometimes I've got to talk a little bit quieter to make sure I've got their attention. You don't walk around with your hands in your pockets like this. So th th there's a lot of carryover. And I even developed a program for CIS at one point that I gave twice on how how acting and singing have helped me become a better teacher because I really believe they have. Any, uh, what are your other comments that you'd like to share with us or any questions that you um, didn't ask? I'd like to put on the record six names that have had a big impact on my life. Two of them go back to Rice University, my college experience. Uh, one of them was Jörg Wasser, whose son is actually on the, the faculty in biology. I discovered that after I had been here a while and after he had been here a while. He is taught, here? The, the, the son is here in biology. I can't think of his first name right off now, W-A-S-E-R. Mm -hmm. But Jörg Wasser taught me freshman chemistry. Oh, it was hard. Uh, <laughs> but what I remember about him was at any time you saw him, if you were struggling with something, he'd drop whatever he was doing and say, let's see how I can help you. And I remember distinctly one time we sat on the steps going into a building that wasn't even the chemistry building and he helped me sort my way through a problem. So he taught me that you've got to pr provide a challenging course, but you've got to be willing to work as hard for the students yes, as you want them to work for you. And I have carried that over to my own teaching and I've told that story to students many times. And the second one from my undergraduate education is John Picard. John Picard taught sophomore English to me. Everyone was scared of John Picard. He had a reputation that preceded him of being just terrible for anybody majoring in the sciences. Well, I got him. And my recollection is that the first day of class he said, who in here is not a science major? And a few hands went up and he said, I want you to transfer to another section. And we all knew that all the rumors we had heard were true. I have never worked so hard for a C plus in my life as I did that first semester. I thought I was telling him exactly what he wanted to hear until I learned he didn't know what I thought he wanted to hear. He wanted to know what I thought and why. And once I discovered that, then I started reading differently and taking his exams differently. And I got a C plus that first semester and I got a B the second semester, so I got a B minus for the year. And I'm as proud of that B minus in English as I am of any of the A's that I got in chemistry. Because he opened to, to me the world of books and that you can, you can go to places you've never been you can see things through other people's eyes. And so, you know, a lot of the books that I have in here, well, they might have some science relation to them, but if you came to my library at home, you discover, I mean, I read, I, I read very widely. And I never read in high school, except when I was required to. My sister read. She had a vocabulary that would just drive me up the wall. I didn't. Uh, but he taught me the joy of reading, and I have read passionately ever since. And so I owe him a great deal. Barney Axelrod, who brought me here, and whose, whose phrase was, that's something every biochemist should know. In other words, don't ever be satisfied. Uh, and he was also a great teacher. So uh, I, I owe him a lot. Uh, George Hess, my postdoc mentor, who taught me the difference between strategy and tactics and who insisted that I work my rear end off in the lab. And my wife I probably wonders if I, why didn't I come home more often? But uh, uh, you had to do the experiment at night because the first thing in the morning, you'd want to know what you did the previous day. And you spend the whole morning talking about that and then you knew the next morning he was gonna to want to know something again, so, so you'd have to be prepared. And then uh, three people here that uh, were at the university, uh, Lowell Harden, who taught me the importance of the international dimension. He was a, a retired at the time ag economist professor, and I got to know him through international programs in agriculture, and we had great discussions about the international dimensions of all sorts of things. 
Don Parlberg, who had similar ties, grew up on a small farm in Indiana, and traveled the world. And he was a great thinker and educator. From him, I learned what I had known but hadn't ever put in words, the origin of the word education. And it's the same as educe, which means to lead out, not to cram in. And I use that in lots of talks with, with students. You're here to be led out, to go someplace you haven't thought about going, not for us to cram knowledge into your head. And uh, uh, the, third, the third one here on campus, uh, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Oh, that, that, that's the, those are the three, Barney Axelrod. And, but then one off campus, Jim Mosley. Uh, Jim Mosley, I first encountered when he was on the school board at Harrah, for Tipping News School Corporation. My kids went to West Lafayette School Corporation, but I used to read about what he was doing in the newspaper. And I got to know him after I became associate dean and his kids started coming to school here. And he went off to Washington. He is an incredibly deep thinker, as, as is Lowell Hardin, as was Don Parlberg. And they just stimulated me to think so much more broadly about what it was I was trying to do and why, and challenging me to craft arguments as to why the position I was espousing was the right one. And that took me back to my debating days in high school, yeah. when you have to be able to listen, you have to be able to argue both sides, which also came out in Tevye, who was always on the one hand, on the other hand. So I've, I've kind of had a career that draws on a lot of different, uh, uh, I don't know what word to use, different threads that, that, that I pull from different directions to define who I am. I'm, I'm not just a biochemist. Uh, and you've been able to uh, appreciate them and to utilize them and yeah. to move forward. Yeah. And, uh, and I've sharing. taught freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, graduate students. The hardest job I ever had one year was when I taught graduate students kinetics from 8.30 to 9.30 and freshmen introductory biochemistry from 9.30 to 10.30. And I had to shift gears from the language of mathematics and graduate students to the language freshmen could understand in 10 minutes between class. That was a learning experience. But it was a profitable learning experience because it reminded me, you've got to know who your audience is at any particular time. Right. Right. And the other question you asked me about was favorite Purdue tradition. And I thought about that. And the only one I could come up with that I would really say I would hang my hat on is Purdue's commencement exercises. And I went to a lot of them because I was chairperson of the University Senate when Steve Beering came here as president. I actually served as chairperson of the Senate on the selection for the president committee. And um, that was a very interesting experience, okay? Um, but when he came, he decided that we should have three commencements a year so that those who graduated in August and December could also have commencement. And that there should be commencements at Fort Wayne and so forth. And so as chair they have not been at the Well, I don't know about okay. those, but there were not three here, I know. That, that I know. And so as associate dean, I led our students across the stage three times a year and sat in the, in the audience. And then one year I was on the stage three times and occasionally I would sub for the dean when he had a, and all the deans of agriculture have still been he's. That will change one day, okay? We've got women department heads in our college now, and we've increased the number of women on our faculty. I've worked awfully hard on that uh, with the deans and the other associate deans. It's not something I did by myself, heavens no. But uh, the commencement exercise is really a marvelous thing with every student walking across the stage, and yes, the undergraduates, their names are just projected. But if it's a May commencement, they get their diploma handed to them. And it is just, it's a beautiful experience. It's well done. It's well done. The people, Very professional. The, the, the parents really appreciate it. The students do too. I've never understood why some students wouldn't want to go through commencement. Let some of them make that decision. I went to the commencements of my kids, and they were going to go to the commencement. <laughs> but th that's the tradition that, uh, that to me is the most important one at Purdue. Right. I think I really appreciate this opportunity to chat with you. I think we really.
covered quite well, a bit. Well, we've covered quite a bit. I don't yeah, know if we... And um, I'm going to sign off here, and I'm going to make yeah. a suggestion. Mm -hmm.